Hey people, so Civ 3 is $5 on Steam right now. A lot of people are picking up for the first time. I mean, maybe you've already picked it up and still haven't got around to playing it yet. So I'm going to show you how. The best way to do that is to just dive right into a new game. So we just go new game. So there's a bunch of settings you can choose. I'm not going to go into all of them. I'm not going to bore you with all that crap, but I'll show you, show you the basics. So uh, normal, temperate, 4 billion. Those are just average settings. Barbarians, sedentary or roaming, both good. Uh, you're going to want to play with 70% water if it's your first game. And you can choose actually between Archipelago, Continents, and a Pangea. So uh, all of those are perfectly fine. The one thing I'd say is that um, some new players struggle a bit with uh, using boats. So you might want to do either of these two, Continents or Pangea. Uh, on the flip side, generally, if you play uh, a Pangea, you're going to have a lot of interaction with rival civs. So that could be war or trade or anything like that. And if you're playing Archipelago, you're more likely to be left to yourself. So uh, we're just going to do Continents here, just because it's the, the in-between option. And World Size, I'd actually recommend a small map if it's your first game. There's two reasons for that. The first is, if it's a small map, then you have less cities, less units, and less stuff to micromanage. Uh, the second reason is, it's kind of hard to close out the game, like to achieve victory on the, the bigger map types. So we're going to go with small. But any of this can do what you want. So you get to pick your civilization here. Uh, they all have unique strengths and uh, not, not weaknesses, but strengths. Uh, so there are eight traits, and each civ has a pair of those two traits, or of those eight traits. So you can pick the one you want most. We're going to go with, let's go with India. So there's the difficulty here. Uh, if you're not familiar with turn-based strategy games or the Civilization franchise, I'd recommend starting on the easiest difficulty. Uh, but if you have played like Civ 4 or Civ 5, I'd actually recommend starting on Warlord. Uh, players who start on, load, on Chieftain can sometimes form some bad habits that you'll be punished for more on higher difficulty levels. So we're going to do Warlord. Uh, these are the default settings. Uh, I turned these two off. This one because it's broken as a feature, and this one because... Why would you want the AI players to respond? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is considered to be the standard rules by the single player community. So that's what we're going to go with. And let's start. So you press continue and the map will generate. It's a new random map every time. Wow, exciting. So we started in the floodplains here. So you start with two units. Sorry, if you chose an expansion of Civ, expansion is one of the traits you can choose. You also start with a scout. They can just scout around with. We start with two units here. The settler and the worker. So the settler does pretty much one thing, and that's build cities. That's what we're going to do with it. This is our city. So this is the city screen. If you click on the city twice, you get to the city screen. From here, you can change production. So this is what your city is going to produce. And you can look at what your citizens are doing. So your city will produce food. You see these little wheat icons? Your citizens consume food. If you produce more food than you consume, your city will grow. So the surplus food gets added to this box. So we get two surplus food per turn. And when the box fills, our city grows to the next size of population. So right now we only have one citizen. When it grows, we will have two citizens. Your city will produce commerce. That can be used for technology and a few other things. We'll talk about that later. And your city also produces shields. So your shields every turn, this is the, how many shields we get. We get one, two shields. Every turn, the shields are added to this box. And when this box fills, then you produce the thing you're working on. So we're going to be building a warrior right now. So when this box fills, we will have produced a warrior. So there's some numbers next to the city you might notice. So this big number right here is the number one. That's how many population is in our city. So there's one person here. So there's a little one next to the city name. Easy to remember. So we're going to grow in 10 turns based on the surplus food we have coming in. So that's what the 10 is for. 10 turns until you grow to the next size, which is going to be size 2 for us. Warrior 5. So that just means the warrior will complete in 5 turns. Simple enough, right? So the second unit you start with is the worker. So once you get to the higher difficulty levels, you're going to want to micromanage the worker yourself and learn the best way to like improve the terrain. We're playing on the easiest difficulty now, level now, so we don't need to do that. We're just going to let the computer handle it for us. So we press this button, or the automate command, or you can press A to do it instead, and then the computer will use the worker for you. So there's less stuff for you to micromanage because it's your first game. You're probably confused enough already. Oops. 
Uh, settings, sorry. You should probably have this turned on. Always wait at end of turn. <laughs> uh, so the worker is working by itself just because we have the automate command turned on. And I'm going to show you the advisors now. So there's a lot of advisors, but there's three that are the most important. So the first one is the domestic advisor. So the big thing you can do in the domestic advisor is you can adjust the science rate. So remember how I said you had income from the city, like the city's producing gold from the tiles and from the city itself? So this gold gets funneled into one of three things. So you can spend it on making your cities happy through the happiness slider. You can spend it on science through the uh, science slider. And if you're not spending on either, the remaining gold gets added to your treasury. So that's why it says net gain plus four per turn. So our city is producing four gold. And if we don't have those sliders set to 0%, then uh, all of that gold goes into the treasury. But we want a tech, so we're going to spend that money. I'd recommend at the start you probably spend 90% of your gold on science. Uh, as the game progresses, you will have other things that will eat up some of your gold. So you're going to need to turn down the science slider probably. And you might find that your cities are unhappy and rioting. And if that happens, you're going to want to turn up the happiness slider. Until that happens, though, you can set it at 0%. Uh, yeah, so we'll put the science slider at 100% for now. And I'll show you the science advisor. So this is a magical place where once you research the tech, so gold goes into science, science goes into these techs, and once the tech is done, you have that technology. So each technology unlocks different things. I mean, some of them unlock nothing, but <laughs> this is the technology tree. So I definitely recommend right-clicking on the technologies and seeing what they do. So, for example, uh, horseback riding. So this unlocks the horseman unit. And if you are playing as the Iroquois, you get this special unit called the Mounted Warrior. Ironworking, same deal, gives you the swordsman. Uh, if you're the Romans, you get the legionary. Persians get the immortal. Celts get the Gallic Swordsman, and it also unlocks the iron resource. So you need the iron resource in order to build Swordsman. Mason, or, hmm. Let's see, map making. So map making lets you do right of passage agreements with other civs. You can build the harbor, that's a city improvement. You can build the galley or the drawman if you are playing as the Byzantines. And it also unlocks the Great Wonder that is the Great Lighthouse. So the Great Wonder, Great Wonder is only one of these can exist in the world. Like if somebody finishes it before you, you lose all your progress on it. Or, I mean, you have to switch to something else. <laughs> so yeah, uh, these are the types of things you can unlock with technology. I definitely recommend right-clicking on these texts and go to the Civlopedia and clicking on them and seeing what they do. So uh, if you're just starting the game and you're looking for, oh, what's the good first tech to do? Uh, what you could do is you go for philosophy. Philosophy gives a free bonus tech to the first Civ to research it. So if you really go for that as fast as possible, it can be it can really pay off. You could also go for ironworking. Like I said, ironworking shows you where the iron is on the map. So if you're planning on doing some fighting, this is a good thing to have. Uh, if you want to do more of some trading, this is a good tech, currency and mathematics. Because the AI usually doesn't research those early on, so you can trade those to the AI and you'll get other techs in exchange for it. So uh, the last advisor I have to show you is the military advisor. This doesn't do much, but the one thing you need to watch is total units and allowed units. So the allowed units is based on your government type, which is despotism at the start of the game, because you haven't unlocked the other governments. And it's based on the number of cities you have. So in despotism, you get four allowed units per city. If you, the number of units you have exceeds the allowed units, then you have to pay for those units. You have to pay unit support. So let's say army support cost. If that is above zero, then you need to pay attention to that. Maybe build more cities or disband some of your units. If you don't, if, if you mind paying those costs. I mean, maybe you're conquering the world and it's totally worth paying 10 gold per turn or whatever for the excess units. So uh, you press this button or you enter or spacebar and it'll end your turn. So we're just going to do that until we have our warrior. So we can scout around with this guy, try to find some other civs, find some good city locations. Ooh, you get extra vision when you're on a mountain. 
And let's keep this warrior at home. So one thing that warriors do, or any military unit does when you're in the city, is provide military police. And military police keeps your city happy. Your city will naturally become unhappy as it grows. Like the more population it has, the more unhappy it has. So you need to find ways to keep it happy. And keeping units in military police is a, a good and cheap way of doing that. So these are the borders of our civilization. You see this purple thing? Really cool. So uh, what borders do is your city citizens can use the tiles from within the border. Uh, enemy units can't use your roads because roads give excess movement. Like, look, you can do this and still have extra movement left over. And uh, enemy units can't heal in your territory. And you can also kick enemy units out of your territory. I mean, that might piss off the enemy civs, but it's something that you can do. So there's some things that you get for having it be within your borders. So it's a good idea to expand your borders when you can. That happens through culture. So some buildings, like the temple or the library, will give you culture. This is the palace. The palace, you automatically get a palace in your capital. And the palace gives you one culture per turn. Uh, but in any other cities, you won't have a palace. So if you want your borders to expand, you need to build a temple or a library. So, looks like we found an enemy civ. They might say hi to us. Korea. We can walk into his land. Normally they're not too happy about that, but I'm sure he'll be okay with it this time. <laughs> uh, so he starts with bronze working. So since we just researched bronze working, he doesn't have any technologies that we don't have. If we wanted to, we can do a trade like 10 gold for ceremonial burial. It's up to you. But maybe he'll research another technology and then we can trade ceremonial burial for that. So, two things. There's the worker unit and the settler. Remember those that we started the game with? The settler will consume two population when it's built. The worker will consume one population. So notice how Delhi is now at two population because there's the little two or the big two next to the, the city name. That means we're at two population. If we build a worker, it will consume one of those populations and we'll be down to size one. Uh, we want to expand, though, so we're going to be building a settler. But first, we have to wait until we're at three population. So, settler is done in ten turns, and the city grows in six turns. So, six turns from now, we'll be at three population, and that means we can build a settler. Because when you build a settler, it consumes two of your population. Uh, so, we'll expand a bit to the, or explore a bit to the south. Ooh. So here you have wines. Wines are a luxury resource. If you build a road between the wines and your capital, and the wines are within your territory, like within the, the colored borders, then you, it provides happiness to your cities. In fact, any t uh, city that has a road to the wines, even if it's not connected to your capital, uh, as long as the wines are within your border, it will give you happiness. So it looks like there's another sieve down here. We'll go say hi to them. Hey, it's Carthage. Oh, nice. So we can trade ceremonial burial for pottery. Generally, it's a good idea to trade texts when you can. Don't worry, you're not going to lose ceremonial burial if you do this. You gain pottery, though, uh, and it means that he gains ceremonial burial. But normally that's like a, a net win for both of your civilizations. So I should talk about what workers do. They can build roads. Roads provide mobility, like they move, make your units move three times faster as long as they're moving along the road. Uh, they also give plus one commerce. So notice how if we use this tile, we get only one commerce, and if we get this tile, we get two commerce. So that's why it's important to build workers, because they increase the, the commerce and the mobility of your civilization. I generally recommend you have at least one worker per city. So we have one city now, so one worker is fine. But we're going to want to build more workers as we expand. Um, yeah, workers can also irrigate, and they can build mines. So mines increase the production. There are some exceptions, but generally they'll provide plus one production to the tile. Irrigation gives plus one food to the tile. So notice that this gives three food, and this one has two food. That's because we did the irrigation, and we got an extra food on that tile. So food, as we talked about before, makes your city grow faster. So it's a good idea to have more food, and obviously you want more production. 
so you can complete stuff in your city faster. So generally you should move, uh, build cities three to four tiles away from each other. So this is a bonus grassland. That's a, a grassland tile with plus one shield. So it's good to build next to grassland. It's also to, good to build on river. So uh, something like this might be a good spot, or this. We'll go with this, because we want that early production from the bonus grassland, though. So now let's build a, a building in Delhi, just for the hell of it. So temples give culture and happiness, but we don't really need the culture, since we get culture from the palace. So uh, instead, we're just going to go for a granary. That seems like a good idea. And we're going to escort that settler, just so nobody else can cause us any problems. So notice how we have five units now, and we're allowed four units. That's why we're starting to lose money. But if we build the city, that should solve that problem. There's also a goody hut here. So the goody huts can give you technologies. Uh, they can give you warriors. They can give you gold. Uh, sometimes they can even give you a free city. So we'll see what we get. Ooh, we get a free warrior. That's nice. We can scout around a little bit up here. So generally, uh, it's a good idea to build a settler in your city once it reaches size 3 or higher. It's an important part of Civ 3 to expand as fast as possible. In Civ 4 or Civ 5, you get penalized for expanding too fast. Like in Civ 5, there's global unhappiness. In Civ 4, there's maintenance fees. In Civ 3, there's none of that. There's no actual penalty to building too many cities too fast. The cities just become less and less useful. Uh, but it's a good idea to have that land for a bunch of different resources reasons. Like, let's say there's some uh, rubber in this jungle. We don't know that now, but having that extra land will give us that advantage. So it's a good idea to take up as much land as possible as soon as possible. The granary will actually let us grow faster. So even though it doesn't seem like it, uh, building that granary is an important part of reaching that goal. So we have iron working, so now we can see where the iron is on the map. So maybe we can prioritize putting a city near that iron. Generally, you want to expand linearly. Like, you don't want to expand too far away from your capital. Like, this is a good city spot next to these wines, but we wouldn't want to put our second city there because it's just too far from our capital. Oh, we get the wheel. Maybe we can trade the wheel for something. Nice, warrior code. So the reason for that is cities are more corrupt the further away from your capital they are. So definitely you want to build these cities close to your capital first and then later spread out. And we can just auto-explore if we want to. Great, let's go for another settler. So our city just grew to size 4, so it's getting pretty big. But we're not having any issues with unhappiness yet, because we got this warrior in here making it happy. If we take the warrior out, suddenly we have problems. Warrior in, everything's Gucci. Great, we got our... Uh, our granary done, so let's start on some more settlers. So as we get further through the tech tree, we might unlock things like governments. So we'll see governments when we come to them, maybe. But if you want to switch government, uh, what you do is you go here. Oh no. So we're having happiness problems, so we can solve that by doing this. So we cannot revolution until we discover another form of government. If you want to switch governments, you go to this tab, and then you click here. So we got our city. So let's prioritize this iron right here. And we want to defend our city first, but then go for a settler. Oh, there's a cow. 
Cow are, cows are really good because they provide extra food and extra production. So when it comes to city placement, the one piece of advice I'd give is place cities along rivers because having access to fresh water is good uh, and next to lakes too for the same reason. But don't place cities on top of bonus food. So don't put the city on top of the cow because remember, you, can't, you need to use the tiles surrounding the city. So you don't get uh, the bonus food if you plant on top of the city. And maybe we should go for these wines here. And a worker. We're falling behind on workers. In fact, let's solve that right now. So to get that iron, we need it to be within our territory, and we need to have a road to the iron. Ooh, we're actually almost going to bro go broke. So we're going to turn down our science spending. And we can actually turn that down too, since we're not having happiness problems anymore. But building a new city should improve our finances. Yep. So since we have some iron, maybe we can go for an attack on the Koreans. To do that, we'd want to build a barracks, right? And normally we're going to automate our workers, but just in this case, we're going to road two to make sure we get that iron. Oops. <laughs> oh, we got barbarians here. Let's try to kill them. Nice. So we got a free tech from uh, being the first civ to discover philosophy. And we'll expand here. Nice. So we killed the barbarian encampment, and we get bonus gold for doing that. So once you reach a certain level of score, you can improve your palace. You can have some fun with that if you like. It doesn't affect the game in any way. And so we want to do some fighting. So we're going to get some barracks first. So normally our warriors have three HP, you'll notice. If we have a barracks before we build the warrior or any other military unit, then that makes it so that the military unit you build uh, has four HP instead of three. They start out being veteran. So one thing is we started on a barracks, but let's say we want to switch to something else. We can switch without any penalty, like we keep all the shields. So like I said, uh, cities that are further away from your capital become more corrupt. So corruption means you lose uh, gold and shields. So here we lose this shield to corruption, we lose this commerce to corruption. We can improve that by building a courthouse. For that reason, you don't need to build a courthouse in your capital since there's no corruption, since it's the center of your empire. Okay, let's start building a military. So the stats on a warrior are 1-1-1. One, one, one. one attack, one defense, one movement. We're going to be able to unlock the swordsman soon. Nice. So we have iron now, and we need iron to build the swordsman. So, swordsman. 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 Good. Ooh. More happiness problems. See, we're growing pretty fast because of that barracks and because of the floodplains that give extra food. <laughs> so maybe it wasn't the best idea to build that granary. So since we're going for an offensive attack, we want to focus on offensive units. So the archer is 2-1-1. One, one. one movement point. Two attack and one defense. 
So a high attack stat means that when you initiate combat, you are more likely to win. A high defense stat means that when the enemy initiates combat, you're more likely to win. So we'll go for some units with high attack stats, archers and swordsmen. Hmm. Sure. So our workers chop down that forest, and that gives us bonus shields. So that's how we got that our, uh, swordsman there. So to move your units around, you can use the, the mouse, or you can use the numpad. If you're not using your units, what you can do is this button. It's fortify or F. So that will just keep them still, and they get a little defense bonus if you do that too. So I think that's enough military units. Let's switch to building some settlers because you can't fall behind with expansion. It's important to expand as fast as possible. Four swordsmen. I think that might do the trick. Oh, no. <laughs> you can also click here and make them an entertainer uh, to solve your happiness problems. So we're going to call it the Koreans. We declare war before we enter their land just to be more honorable. Uh, they'll like they'll dislike you if you don't do that So we'll go here. So Pyongyang is actually on a hill, so he'll get a little bonus to his defense 50% So we'll see how it goes So this is combat Warriors aren't very strong on offense or defense, so we did okay Plus we get 25% combat bonus when defending in the jungle So we initiate the attack like this Ooh, he's got two spearmen in there. Nice. So, the city is size 1, so it gets automatically raised. If the city is bigger than size 1, you will have the option to capture the city, which you generally want to do, because capturing the city, I mean, it's good to have cities. So yeah, that's how you fight. And yeah, I think that's the end of my tutorial for now. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments. And uh, I'll be sure to like post a link to the rest of my tutorials because I go over more advanced topics. But yeah, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.